If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Last week, we asked the question, what is legalism and what are the dangers of legalism? And I asked, if somebody were to come to you and ask, what is legalism and what are the dangers of legalism, would you be able to answer them biblically? Would you be able to talk with them through what it looks like to live out a legalistic heart, a pharisaical mindset? And we saw that example in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 of the way that the Pharisees responded to Jesus. Jesus' dealings with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders, all the controversies that we've looked at the last five different weeks, the five different controversies. The last two that we looked at dealt with Sabbath day controversies. And the last one was actually Jesus taking the initiative to intentionally walk into the controversy with the religious leaders. We saw how Jesus was preaching a message, a gospel, that offended the religious and the irreligious. The Pharisees and the Herodians alike were angry with him and wanted to destroy him. That's where we've been the last uh, five Lord's Days looking at these five controversies. But now, what Mark's going to do is he's going to pull the camera back. He's been very focused on specific people, a specific response to Jesus. This is what it looks like for the religious leaders to respond with a legalistic mindset to Jesus. But now, what Mark's going to do is pull back after these five episodes of very specific controversy. He's going to pull back and he's going to show us some broad brush strokes sweeping reactions at the responses that two different groups of people have towards Jesus. And because of this, this leads us to another question that I'd like to ask you, how would you answer? How would you answer if somebody came to you and they said, what is the purpose of church? What's the purpose? Why is the church here? Why do we exist? There's a lot of answers that people can give for that, but most easily defined, it's just two words. It's make disciples. It's make disciples. Obviously, we want to glorify the Lord in all that we do, but the purpose of why we're here, the purpose of why we gather, the purpose of why we're equipped and then scattered into the world during the week is to make disciples. You know the passage very well, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus said, the main verb there is make disciples. He tells us three ways that we do that in the participles around that main verb. We make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching. But the whole point of the church, of going out as believers into the world, is to make disciples, which begs another question. What is a disciple? What is a disciple? How would you define that? What is a disciple? The word in Greek, mathetes, it just means a learner, somebody who's learning. What is a disciple? So what's the purpose of the church? It's to make disciples. Okay, so what is a disciple? And this morning, I believe that we will see five different aspects of what a disciple is and what a disciple isn't. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to do a broad overview of verses 7 through 19, And then next Lord's Day, we're going to dive deep into the latter half of these verses. But what I want us to do is see five different aspects in these verses about what a disciple is and what a disciple is not, based off of what Mark tells us this morning. So let's read Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, and ask God's blessing on our time this morning. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. And he was earnestly warning them not to tell who he was. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted and they came to him. And he appointed 12 so that they would be with him, that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the 12, 
Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These are the words of our holy, awesome, and gracious God. Let's ask his blessing on our time this morning that he would write their eternal truths on our hearts together. Father, we do ask that you would be gracious to us this morning as we come before you, desperate, needy beggars. We want to be transformed by the gospel. We want to be changed from the inside out. As we stare at Christ, we want to be transformed to look more like him. But all of these desires, though good and godly, they will never come to pass if it isn't for your spirit doing that work in us. So we give ourselves to your word and we ask that your word would pierce our hearts. That we would be forever changed by this morning, by our time in your word. And that as we feast upon Christ, that you, Holy Spirit, would be gracious to open our eyes, that we would behold wonderful things from your law. Speak to us now by the power of your word, according to the promise of your spirit, in the precious name of your son. Amen. Five different aspects about what a disciple is and what a disciple is not. The first is this. Number one, a disciple is more than a fan. The disciple is more than a fan. This is verses 7 through 10. Mark starts out in verse 7 by saying that Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, the Sea of Galilee. A great multitude from Galilee is following him. And then he lists these different geographical regions. Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. All that is is north, south, east, and west. He's saying from all over the place, people are coming to see Jesus. But the question is why? Verse 8 tells us. A great number of people heard all that he was doing and they came to him. They heard what he was doing. He's a miracle worker. He's healing people. And so they want to be near him. They want to see him. And verses 9 through 10 tells us of the wild popularity of Jesus. He's telling his disciples because of the size of the crowds that he needs a boat to stand ready because they're pressing in on him that they could crush him. He needs a getaway car because he doesn't know if they're going to press so strongly in on him like a mob pressing around him that he might die. Just reading through this text, I don't know if you've ever thought that before. We, we have places in the scriptures where Jesus says, my time has not yet come. Uh, and he, he's not going to die that way, right? In Nazareth, they want to pick him up and throw him off a cliff. No, my time's not yet come. And he walks in their midst. They pick up stones to stone him because they hate that he has made himself equal with God. And he says, my time has not yet come. I'm not dying in this way. He's also saying here, my time hasn't come. I'm not going to be crushed to death by a crowd. The word for crowd here in verse 9 is more like the word mob. Just picture a rock show with no seats and just everybody pressing in on you and you're just getting squished and you feel like they might, uh, you know, break your ribs. That's what's happening to Jesus. He has enormous celebrity, but the reason why mainly is not because of his teaching, but because of his miracles. Most of his fame is coming from fans, not followers. Jesus had a lot of fans, but a disciple is much deeper than just a fan. Fans are fickle. This country is filled with a lot of fans of Jesus, which is very dangerous. Many are deceived into thinking that because I'm a fan of Jesus, that somehow I am a follower of Jesus. It's easy to be a fan of Jesus in America, maybe for not much longer, which some people um, struggle with that. I actually think that might be a very good thing for the church. I'm not praying for persecution to come, but if it does come, it's not going to be a bad thing for the church because it'll weed out those that are just fans and not give them any more room for self-deception. It's not easy to be a fan of Jesus in Afghanistan. It's not easy to just like Jesus in Iraq. But here in America, it's very easy to just feel like discipleship equals I like Jesus. I'm a fan. 
But remember, the Great Commission does not say go and make crowds. Great Commission does not say go and make fans of Jesus. No, it's go and make disciples, meaning there is a kind of following of Jesus that is different than real discipleship. There's a kind of following that says, I want to be near him. Maybe you want something from him, but you don't want him. This is what Hebrews 6 tells us. There's a warning in Hebrews 6 of people who are around the things of the Lord, and they love it. They feel like they have a family because they're around the church. They feel like they have been given a purpose and been given meaning. They feel like they've tasted of something that's supernatural and divine. And yet they're not a true disciple. And there's a warning that if those people stay in that state for too long, they will never turn to Jesus. This is what John 6 says. Jesus says, you seek me. This is after Jesus uh, performs the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They get bread and they say, we want you to be our king. And he says, you seek me not because of who I am, not because you saw the signs that led to clearly articulate, I am God, very God. No, you seek me because you want bread. You seek me because of what I have to offer. The disciples, on the other hand, are going to follow Jesus for something different, something much deeper. The the, the issue, the difference here is motive. Why are you following Jesus? It's a great question for you and for me. Why are you here? Why are you following Jesus? Why are you here? Maybe it's because you're looking for a family. Maybe it's because you're looking for a friend. Maybe you're looking for love. Maybe you're looking for acceptance. Maybe you're looking for Fill in the blank. Here's the good news. Jesus knows exactly why you're here. Jesus knows why you're here. He knows what you're looking for. And he loves you and he wants you to not be a fan, but be a follower. A disciple is more than a fan. Verses 7 through 10. The second aspect of discipleship, number two, a disciple is more than agreeing with and believing what is true. A disciple is more than agreeing with and believing what is true. This is verses 11 through 12. So number one, a disciple is more than a fan, but then beyond that, a disciple is more than just agreeing with and believing what is true. This is verses 11 through 12. Whenever the unclean spirits saw Jesus, they would fall down before him and they would shout. So they would submit themselves to him, And then they would shout, you are the son of God. That's a true statement. This is a good confession. Anybody who says Jesus is the son of God, he is God, very God. He is Lord. Anybody who says that, that's a good confession. And if you believe that, that's good that you believe that. But you can believe that and so much more. You can believe that you are a sinner. You can believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. You can believe that he rose from the dead. You can believe that there's a heaven and a hell. You can believe all of those things. Agree with those facts and believe that those facts are true and still not be saved. The demons do that. They believe all those things are true. But they're not disciples because a disciple is more than just agreeing with and believing what is true. For instance... I believe that Adolf Hitler was the leader of the Nazi party. I believe he wrote the book Mein Kampf. I believe that he was the head of one of the three Axis powers in World War II, along with Italy and Japan, fighting against the Allies. I believe that he murdered millions and millions of people because of his hatred and his racism. I believe that he killed himself on April 30th, 1940. 45, but does my knowledge of all of those facts and my belief that those facts are true make me a Nazi? Clearly not. Why? I agree that those facts are true. I believe that those facts are true. And I hate the reality of those facts. I don't align myself with any of those truths. I don't align myself with any of that worldview. It's the exact same thing that the demons are doing with Jesus. They believe all of these facts about Jesus and they are true facts and they are good facts, but they hate that they're true. The demons, James chapter two, verse 19, believe that Jesus is God. They believe that Jesus is Lord. There is one God, only one God. They believe that and they tremble, but they don't love and worship and treasure Jesus. A confession does not make a disciple. 
It needs to be more than an affirmation of truth. This is why we always say it's more than just imparting knowledge. It's more than head knowledge. We say seeing and savoring Jesus Christ. See him clearly in the scripture, but love him more. That's why everything we do targets the affections and not just grow head knowledge. If it's just growing head knowledge, think about this. Go over to children's ministry. What are we trying to do in children's ministry? We're teaching the scriptures. Why are we teaching the kids the scriptures? If it's just, we want you to know facts about Jesus, then the devil could be in that children's ministry service. The devil could be in that classroom and say, this is fine. This is true. These are true realities. And if the devil could flourish in our Bible studies and in our children's ministry classrooms and in our worship service, we're doing the wrong thing. We're not targeting the right thing. We need to target, don't you love Jesus because of these realities? He's Lord. The devil would say, yes, he is, and I hate it. And we love Jesus. The devil would say, don't say that. Don't say that to these kids. Don't say that to these people. Demons cry out, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, I don't need your help. I don't want your help. Don't tell people who I am. That's going to be confusing. You're the wrong source. This is also the wrong time. Don't speak. These two verses just point to the reality that a disciple is more than just agreeing with and believing what is true. Number three, a disciple is made a disciple by the call of Jesus. A disciple is made a disciple by the call of Jesus. So number one, a disciple is more than a fan. Number two, a disciple is more than agreeing with and believing what is true. Number three, a disciple is made a disciple by the call of Jesus. Jesus. This is verse 13. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus went to the mountain to pray the whole night before calling these 12 disciples to himself. And we'll talk more about these verses. We're going to study verses 13 through 19 next Lord's Day, Lord willing. We'll go deeper into these verses, verses 13 through 19. But I want us to get a broad overview of the difference between the crowds that we saw earlier and the call that we see now. Jesus' appointment of these disciples is not coincidental. It's not accidental. It's a summons. Look at that word in verse 13. He went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. Without that call, they would never have come. No disciple signs themselves up. You remember back in Jesus' day, the rabbis were chosen by their disciples. It's like a college student picking a college they want to go to. I I check out a bunch of different colleges, I apply, and then I say, you know what, I pick this one. That's how discipleship works. I pick you, rabbi. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to summon you to myself. And my friends, unless Jesus calls you, you will never be a disciple. Unless Jesus calls you, you'll never follow him. Becoming a disciple is just very simply answering the call that Jesus has given, a summons to follow him. Number four, a fourth aspect of discipleship is that a disciple's purpose is simple. A disciple's purpose is simple. A disciple is more than a fan. A disciple is more than agreeing with and believing what's true. A disciple is made made a disciple by the call of Jesus. And fourthly, a disciple's purpose is simple. This is verses 14 through 15. He appointed 12. We're going to talk about this more next Lord's Day. When a Jewish person would hear that sentence, that statement, that Jesus appointed 12. When they hear the number 12, they would freeze in their tracks. Jesus is doing something foundational here. And we'll talk about that next Sunday. But then he goes on to say, he appoints 12 so that they would be with him, that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. Those three phrases really simplify what discipleship is all about. I think that we in the church tend to make discipleship far more complicated and complex than Jesus ever intended it to be. It's really three things. If you can see in these verses, three things. Number one, discipleship is being with Jesus. What's a disciple's purpose? It's simple. Be with Jesus. Be with him. He says that in verse 14, so that they would be with him. I want you to be with me. That's what Jesus is saying. 
The most important part of the call of discipleship is the proximity that it gives you to Jesus. He says, be with me. Question is, do you want to be with him? You will not answer that call if you don't want him. He says, I want you, come be with me. And if you say, I don't want you, you will not be a disciple. But if you are a disciple, that means that in your heart of hearts, you have said, Jesus is my greatest joy. I want to be with him. I want to spend time with him. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, just follow me as I follow Christ. I'm just following him. I'm with him. Be with me as I'm with him. Let's all be with him together. Discipleship, very simply, is just loving, trusting, and obeying Jesus. Don't overcomplicate it. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, I'm concerned for the church in Corinth that you are drifting away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So how are you doing with your relationship with Jesus? Do you spend time with him? Do you listen to him in, your, in the word? Do you talk to him in prayer? Do you love being with him? The second aspect of a, the, the simplicity of the purpose of discipleship is to speak of Jesus. So number one, we're with Jesus. Number two, we speak of Jesus. Verse 14, they would be with him and then he could send them out to preach, to announce that the king has come. Some kind of word ministry. Every disciple of Jesus is called to minister the word in some way. Not preaching in the pulpit per se, but in some way, shape, or form, we are all called as disciples to speak of Jesus, to make other disciples, to herald the truth. Notice the one comes before the other. Be with him in order to speak of him. You need to be with him in order to speak of him. You will not be effective if you're not with him. And you will also not be affected if you just stay with him and don't speak of him. You have to do both. Thirdly, and finally for a disciple's simple purpose, is we are to be transformed by Jesus. We are to be with him, we're to speak of him, and be transformed by him. We're to be transformed. He says in verse 15 that these disciples were given authority to cast out the demons. Other gospels tell us they were given authority to heal. They were going to go into the world and show them that the inbreaking of the kingdom has come. Jesus is transforming this world. So for them, it's casting out demons and healing. For us, it's not that. But for us, there is going to be, if we are disciples of Jesus, there will be a demonstration that Jesus has transformed our lives. He's transforming the culture around us in our church and changing us from the inside out. And the world's going to see that as we go out. So be with Jesus, speak about Jesus, and be transformed by Jesus. That's what discipleship is. A disciple's purpose is simple. Fifth and finally, the fifth aspect of discipleship. A disciple is anyone joyfully willing to trust and obey Jesus, no matter the cost. A disciple is anyone Notice this list of people. It's anyone. There's a, the background of these disciples that are chosen are different. They're, they're different people. A disciple can be anybody, but a disciple joyfully, willingly trusts and obeys Jesus no matter the cost. A disciple is anyone joyfully willing to trust and obey Jesus no matter the cost. This is verses 16 through 19. We have a list of 12 people, the 12 disciples, the 12 followers of Jesus. Again, we're going to do a deep dive on these 12 next Lord's Day, but just look at this list. We have four fishermen, we have one tax collector, we have one zealot, and then we have six other people that we really don't know anything about. It's so encouraging to me that we know just next to nothing about these other six people. My friends, don't judge your worth or your value based on how famous or known you are. These 12 men, six of whom we know a decent amount, six of whom we know next to nothing about, they literally, Jesus says, turned the world upside down. They changed the world. And we know almost nothing about half of them. I love that. And besides being Jewish men, the diversity in this group is tremendous. Really, the only thing in common is that Jesus had called them. That's what binds them together. Jesus called them, and they joyfully followed. And we, we've seen the calls 
already the two groups of brothers, right? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they leave everything behind to follow Jesus. They say, Jesus is better than what I'm leaving behind. Even though it's much, it's family, it's money, it's a secure job, it's a place to live. I'm leaving it behind. Why? Because Jesus is better. And we saw the call of Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, the call to leave your sinful ways behind and follow me. And he joyfully does that. Why? Because he can have forgiveness, freedom from guilt, shame removed, full restoration with the God of the universe. A disciple is more than a fan. A disciple is more than agreeing with and believing what is true. A disciple is made a disciple by the call of Jesus. The disciple's purpose is very simple, to speak of Jesus, to be with Jesus, and to be transformed by Jesus. And a disciple is anyone joyfully willing to trust and obey Jesus, no matter the cost. These are the the crowds and the called. So my question is, what does Mark want us to learn from the crowds and the called? Again, just broad overview. We're not diving as deep as we normally do. We'll do that next Lord's Day. Broad overview. What does Mark want us to learn from the juxtaposition of the crowds and the called. After giving us five very specific and narrow views of controversies with one people group, the religious leaders, now he's pulling back and he's showing us, here's the reaction and response of a whole host of people in a multitude of mobs and crowds. And here's the response of 12 individuals that Jesus called. What does Mark want us to learn? Three aspects, just in in conclusion here, for application. Number one, Mark wants us to learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. That's what he wants us to learn. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It isn't about being fascinated with him. It's about following him because of your love for him. That's not what the crowd was about. That's why much of the crowd, most of the crowd will fall away because Jesus isn't their greatest treasure. He was just offering them their greatest treasure. Maybe I can get bread through him. Maybe I can get security through him. Maybe I can get life through him, healing through him, nutrition through him. Whatever it is, it was, I don't want you. I want what you can give me. Judas is a reminder on this list of the 12 disciples of how close you can be to Jesus and still completely be lost. Mark is showing us these these big, broad brushstrokes of these responses and reactions to show us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I just, I want to ask you, who are you more like? Are you more like the crowds or are you more like the called? Again, why are you here? Are you more like the crowds or more like the called? The second point of application, I think that Mark wants us to see that only Jesus' call produces true disciples. Only Jesus' call produces true disciples. Jesus calls them. Again, the student would normally go to a rabbi and say, I want to follow you, but not so with Jesus. Jesus says, you follow me. And that tells us something about discipleship. Discipleship is a who before it ever is a what. You don't do before you see and savor what has been done in your place, on your behalf, because of the love of Christ for you. That's what sets discipleship apart from every other religious system, Religion says do, Christianity says done. It is finished, it is accomplished. Now follow me and you get every single benefit of what I have to offer because of what I've accomplished for you. And we say, I want you, Jesus, I want you. If we follow Jesus that way, there will be no part of our lives that Jesus does not invade And we will follow him with unrestrained, unlimited obedience. Not perfectly, but progressively. Just as Judas is on this list to remind us of how close we can be to Jesus and still be lost, so too Peter is on this list as a reminder of how much of a mess you can make of your life and still be a rock in his service. But only Jesus' call produces true disciples. And my friends, No matter who you are, no matter why you are here this morning, Jesus is calling you. Through the proclamation of his word, through the proclamation of the gospel, he is calling you. Come and follow 
me. A third point of application, we'll wrap up here. Disciples love making disciples. This passage, if we live it out to its fullest extent and conclusion, which we're going to see over the course of this gospel and beyond, disciples love making disciples. So often I think that people feel discipleship is some higher level of Christianity. Like you become a Christian and then you become a disciple maker or then you're involved in discipleship if you're like next level Christian. Discipleship is not a higher level of Christianity. Christianity equals discipleship. That's what it is to be a Christian. It means you are a disciple. If you are a believer, you are either involved in discipleship, in being discipled and discipling others, or you're being disobedient. Those are the only two options. But our job as disciples given by Jesus is to make the call of Christ known to others. This is what our dear friend Micah preached on a few weeks ago. Uh, with the call to be ambassadors of Christ. That's our job. But I want, I want to remind you, go back up to verse 13. The reason why we love making this call of discipleship is not because we have to, not because we want to check something off of the list, not because it's a spiritual discipline that we need to do in order for God to somehow love us more, which that's not true. The reason why we want to tell other people about Jesus, come follow him, is because of how much he loves us. We're just simply saying in discipleship, I have met the master, just like Andrew. Remember, Andrew tells his brother Peter, hey, we've met the Messiah. We found him. Come with me. You're just introducing someone to a friend. That's what discipleship is. And the reason why you love to do that is a phrase that I think is just so profound in verse 13. Jesus goes up to the mountain and he summons those whom he himself wanted. This is why we are motivated to tell people about Jesus. You go to somebody and you say, I want you to meet someone who wanted me. He wanted me. With all of my failings, with all of my sin, I have given God every reason not to want me. And he never changes his mind. I want you. And that grace and that love and that mercy makes me say, oh my word, you have to meet the one who wants you. He wants you. He loves you. He died for you. Why wouldn't you want to follow him? And I think hidden inside that verse is one reason why maybe you wouldn't want to follow him. Because you're thinking, who wouldn't want me? Uh, that's great, he wants me. So many other people do. Who wouldn't want me? But when you see the desperate, despicable depravity of your own sin, you're going to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. anybody wants me in the universe? That's impossible. Not to mention the God of the universe who is holy, sinless, and I offend him with my sin every single day, and he still says, I want you, and I'll do all the work to bring you to myself. You don't have to do anything. I'll do it all. I'll pay it all because I love you. He wants you. Brothers and sisters, he wants you. He wanted you. He died for you. He wants you still. There is nothing that you could do as a son or a daughter of the king to remove yourself out of that family relationship because he has always wanted you and he will always want you. And my friend, if you are here this morning and you do not know if you are in the family of God, you do not know if your sins have been paid for. You have never confessed sin for what it is. You've offended a holy God that your sin deserves punishment, not just death in this life, but death for all of eternity. And then you see it a man who says, I am God and I will die in your place. I will live in your place, perfect obedience. I will die in your place, bearing your suffering, bearing your wrath, bearing your punishment, bearing your penalty. I will do away with it so that you could be forgiven and I will rise again on the third day to conquer sin and death and hell forever. And I offer that to you because I want you. God doesn't just want to forgive you. 
Forgiveness just gets all of the junk out of the way so that he can love you and be with you because he wants you. And if you know that love and you know that you are wanted and you know that you are cherished and you know that you are loved, remember what Zephaniah says, that God sings over his saints. He sings over you. He celebrates you. If you know that love, you're going to say to others, you have to know the God who loves you too. That's what discipleship is. And we have the privilege this morning of hearing of two men who have answered that call and says, yes, Jesus has called me because he wants me and I want to follow him and I want to make his name known to the ends of the earth. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the time that we're able to spend uh, even just briefly this morning in your word to see the call of discipleship. God, I pray that you would encourage our hearts, comfort us with the call that you've given for those that are believers in Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of the King. May they know and feel and experience your desire for them. You love them. You want them. You paid it all for them. And if you freely gave us your son, how will you not with him give us all things? And for those here this morning that don't know you, they know about you. They know facts are true. They believe that those facts are true. But there's something standing in the way between them truly following you, treasuring you, and, and deciding to just hold back, to be a fan and not a follower. I pray that your word this morning would challenge them, would convict them. I pray that the testimonies this morning that go forth of the transforming nature of the gospel in the life of these two individuals would also go forth with power. And that they would not leave here without a, a true sense of making a decision. Either I cherish and treasure Jesus, I love him more than anything in this world, or I just say no to him, but, but I can't be a fan. That's not true discipleship. God, even just reveal to us by your grace, reveal to us why we are here. Reveal our heart's idols and deepest desires and how we might even use church, might even use you to get something that we love more than you. And then help us to own that, confess that as sin, and turn and trust in Jesus, both now and forevermore. We pray in the name of our Savior. Amen.